everyone. Welcome back to Apocalypse Here as we continue on with our review of Bruce McCormack's The Humility of the Eternal Sun. We're now moving into Chapter 5. So make sure before listening to this that you've caught up with the other videos. Um, I'm glad to be back doing this. It's been fun. So we're going to move into McCormack's first explicitly exegetical chapter, specifically on some of the Pauline data and a little bit of Hebrews. I've kind of left that a bit brief just to keep this video short. Um, what he's wanting to do in this chapter is to see how these texts invite us to think about the Christological subject, um, what these texts open up for us as possibilities for theological or dogmatic reflection, where they kind of fall silent, um, and what they seem to prohibit in his language from further theological commitments. I will say up front, I'm not so sure I would put that last point as strongly as McCormack, though. Um, I think his approach to the Bible is a bit different from my own, but I, um, because I don't think texts themselves place prohibitions on dogmatics, what we can and can't say, um, the only thing or reality that does so is the living God revealed in Jesus Christ, not principally the scriptures. That's a subtle but important distinction. It's really common for evangelicals to use scripture understood in a particular way um, to kind of eclipse the authority of, of Jesus. Um, I'm just sort of particularly sensitive to where that can go wrong. I don't think McCormack would disagree with that, but it seems to me the way that he positions scripture authoritatively is more in line with sort of older Protestant reformed approaches than I'm I'm comfortable with. Um, but that's kind of a different conversation. With that said, I found this chapter on Paul and Hebrews to be extremely helpful at illuminating the some of the positive ontological claims or ontological avenues um, of both authors and also what they are not claiming, especially in relation to later dogmatic claims made from Chalcedon onward. So he begins with the Christ hymn in Philippians 2. So what's going on here? Uh, McCormick, McCormick starts off by giving the proper context of the hymn. Paul is exhorting his community to live selflessly in relation to each other by being of the same mind, same love, being in full accord, etc. And there's Christological rationale for that. The mind of Christ, which is a certain sort of mind that entails a certain way of acting. But what sort of activity is this? Is it performed by God in this hymn? Or is it acted as a human by the human Jesus? It seems at least initially that this is a human act on the part of Jesus. There may be more to it, but we kind of have to see. So this is basically how McCormack sets the context, not committing up front to too much, as it were. To quote him, for now it is crucial only to say that the Philippians are called to have a mindset in themselves, at minimum, um, and that mindset is also human and well within their capacity to imitate. End quote. But even if it does end up being divine as well, humans could still imitate it, right? That's not out of bounds. So McCormick then moves to talk about the hymn's structure, the majority parts sort of being verses 6 through 8, and then also 9 through 11. Now he sees the second part, 9 through 11, as providing the key to figuring out what's actually going on in 6 through 8. This sets him up to begin his theological exegesis by suggesting that part 2, 9 through 11, helps give the answer to who it is who empties himself. So that's where he starts. He's going to start in 9 through 11. So picking up initially on the intertextual dimension in play concerning Isaiah 45, with you know every knee bowing and confessing that the God of Israel um, alone is God, McCormack correctly sees Paul suggesting that it is Jesus' name that this occurs because God now includes in himself, as proper to him, the man Jesus. This name is given to Jesus by God. In other words, it is a revelation of an already existing reality, namely that there, quote, 
exists a relation to Jesus that is proper to the one God of Israel, so that the to me, every knee bowing to me, that the God of Israel would say, includes to him, to Jesus, and vice versa, end quote. In this naming of Jesus, God also is giving himself a new kind of name, the Father. So confessing Jesus's lordship in this context is at the same time confessing the Father's relation to him as well. Now McCormack points to 1 Corinthians 8, 6 as corroborating this reading and also giving us more information to do with Jesus's pre-existence. So to quote McCormack, indeed, if Jesus Christ is present at the beginning, which 1 Corinthians 8, 6 seems to suggest with Jesus being involved in creation, um, and at the end in establishing God's eschatological rule, then he must be intrinsic to God's identity and eternally so, end quote. So having a clear role in creation requires Jesus's pre-existence. But what about Jesus's exaltation in verses 9 through 11 of Philippians 2? Instead of exaltation being some kind of reward or prize, for McCormack, it is a divine attestation of the fact of Jesus's equality with God, which has already existed and is now being revealed in his self-emptying in his journey to the cross. It's not an, a, a sort of addition necessarily, but a, a recognition of what has always already been the case for Jesus in relation to God, specifically God the Father. But we need to talk about this self-emptying that's so big in Philippians 2, moving us back to the first part of the hymn, verses 6, six through 8. First, what does it mean for Jesus to have existed in the form of God? Now, you're going to have to read the book to get into the details of his exegesis, but McCormick construes form essentially as mode of existence, which I'm not unhappy with. Paul would then be speaking of two modes of existence, the affirmation that Jesus has a role to play or had a role to play in creation prior to taking the form of the slave, a different mode of existence, a second. So what about the claim in the text did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited or grasped, which is how it's usually translated. This could be taken to mean that the form of God is something you either hold on to tightly or you give up which would put pressure on how to make sense of, quote-unquote, but emptied himself in the text. But this is why McCormack began, I think astutely, with verses 9 through 11, to kind of figure out what's going on in 6 through 8. McCormack sees a better reading as, quote, Christ Jesus did not regard equal that equality with God that was his, right? We see this in 9 through 11, it was his, as something to be used for his own advantage. This seems to be a better reading, and it does make more sense of Paul's ethical points up, up front in chapter two, where Paul is telling his community not to do things for selfish ambition or thinking that you're better than other people or acting in your own self-interest, right? Instead, have Jesus's mind and act in this way, a way that doesn't regard what was his nature, right? Equality with God, as something to be used for his own advantage. So I think it really does make sense of the context a bit better. The right way to live looks like emptying oneself for the other. But how do we make sense of, quote unquote, emptied himself? For McCormack, Christ did this by taking the form of a slave, by becoming human, by adding to the form of God the form of a slave. What we can't see here clearly, according to McCormack, is just what the ontological status of this edition actually means. Paul doesn't go there. What we can say is that Jesus's selflessness is something that's constitutive of his first mode of existence, which denominates the form of the slave. It doesn't contradict it. So selflessness has an ontological significance, both as pre-existence, and in Jesus's historical lived existence. So quote, in any event, selflessness before, in, and after the act of incarnation would seem to be foundational to Paul's Christology, end quote. So what's clear at this point in McCormack's ex exegesis is that the pre-existent Jesus self-empties self in a way that makes incarnation possible. It's the same agent as the one who 
now humbles himself becomes obedient to death on the cross. And also the divine act of self-emptying and the humbling of the human in this world are two modes of existence of one and the same subject. Paul simply assumes this unity, but he doesn't say more about it. What we have is a single act that is divine or eternal in its origin and human in its realization in time. And McCormack goes on to show how this reading illuminates other passages in Paul, but for the sake of time, we're going to move on to his provisional dogmatic assessment vis-a-vis -vis Chalcedon. Paul's emphasis clearly falls on the idea that the same subject empties himself in pre-existence and engages in humble, selfless obedience in his lived existence and time. There's no sense of a divine substance or a human substance in his thinking. So Paul would seem to only really cohere with Chalcedon to the extent that he talks about the unity of the person involved. There's really not much beyond that. What McCormack suggests is that we're invited to see that Jesus' self-emptying begins as divine and ends as human, one and the same divine and human subject. Other God concepts just don't seem to make sense here. Now, since I'm wanting to keep this on the shorter side, I don't want to really delve into his exegesis of Hebrews. You can read the book for that. I'll just say that with respect to Jesus offering up prayers in Hebrews, loud cries and tears, learning obedience, right, becoming perfected um, through suffering, all that, sort of all that sort of stuff, McCormack sees the one divine human subject as the subject of all of these things. He doesn't see warrant to go with one or the other depending on what is being said about Jesus' suffering or learning, right? To quote him, it is God as human, not the human Jesus alone, but God as human, who is the subject of the loud cries and tears. No separation of the divine from the human is permitted. So in conclusion, all of this does not mean that Jesus exhaustively defines the second person of the Trinity, like we got with some of the post Bardians, where they're simply equated. What it does mean, though, is that the second person of the Trinity should be understood as composite, both God and human, from McCormack. So he finishes up this chapter by saying, quote, the son is incarnandus, the son becoming incarnate, until he becomes incarnatus, the son having now become incarnate. On both sides of this relation, the identity of the subject is full and completely the same, end quote. So in the next video, we're going to go on with some, some more of his exegesis. We're going to move to how he sees the Christological subject in the Synoptic Gospels and also in the Gospel of John. So thank you for watching this video. Please like and subscribe to the channel. Leave a comment. It's always very helpful. Um, and thank you for watching all of the other videos that I put out in this book review series. It means a lot. So with that, this has been Apocalypse Here, Christianity You Can Live With. Um.